Hello, everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just want to thank you very much for your time in advance. Hope everybody's having a fantastic day so far. So uh, there's been some pretty considerable volatility over the last 48 hours. Uh, of course, we had the Federal Reserve rate decision yesterday, had the ECB rate decision earlier this morning, on top of a bunch of other items that have been pushing to and fro in markets. I think maybe one of the more compelling drivers showed up this morning in the form of a tweet from President Trump. Uh, highlighting some progress or some hope on the front of the ongoing U.S.-China trade dispute. That's helped to provide a pretty noticeable dent in some of those post-FOMC trends. And we're going to look at that today as well as a few other themes of interest. But as usual, this webinar is all about you, ladies and gentlemen. So setups you have, pairs you want to take a look at, feel free to fire those my way. I will do my absolute best to answer as many as I can when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, before we get to the charts, I need to show you this hypothetical trading disclaimer. I'm going to leave this up for just about 10 seconds, and then we will proceed. But uh, any questions you have or pairs you want to take a look at, fire those in the chat box. I'll do my, do my best to look at those when we get to the Q&A portion. All right, that's 10 seconds by my watch, so let's make this happen. All right, first and foremost, USD. Um, so post-FOMC, did technically see the currency set a fresh three-month low. Uh, now, coming into the rate decision, it was kind of a nasty little scenario down here around support, as in we had this October swing low that came in like 97.14. Early November, a swing low pushed just below that, but buyers quickly returned, uh, pushing prices higher through the early portion of November. Uh, FOMC yesterday, as we looked at on Tuesday, the dollar came in or went into that event in somewhat of a, it felt like a very oversold type of state. We had a quick flicker of strength going into the rate decision. <clears throat> but the rate decision itself, you can see right in here, is what helped to push USD below those two swing lows, setting a fresh three-month low. I think actually this is a technical four-month low, yeah, a technical four-month low at this point. But that's when the proverbial music stopped. Everything slowed down. We had an ECB rate decision on the calendar for today. Uh, yesterday, uh, looking at this yesterday for tomorrow or today. And a few other items of note. But again, the thing that really appears to have created this counter trend movement uh, is that tweet from President Trump in which he talks about progress on the U.S.-China trade deal. Right, that ECB rate decision was was over finished right around here, right around 9:30 Eastern time. The statement dropped at 7:45. Press conference began at 8:30, and then it was right around U.S. market open that that tweet from President Trump came out, and you can see where that brought in a big move of dollar strength, at least on a short-term basis, as a large portion of those post FOMC losses were wiped away. Now you can see we were pushing right back in area that was showing or holding as resistance ahead of that rate decision yesterday. So it's been a fun ride, but we're right back to where we had started. Um, now, on that front, it's already been a really busy week. Understandably, there's probably quite a few beleaguered market participants out there, but the week isn't done yet. Uh, tomorrow brings inflation um, expectations out of the UK and then advanced retail sales out of the US. That's at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Next week is also pretty climactic. Uh, we have a BOJ rate decision. A few different inflation prints, UK, Canada. Uh, later in the week, we get uh, Japanese inflation. A couple of rate decisions. Uh, the Bank of England, that's next Thursday. And then later on, Thursday afternoon, we get Banksico with the uh, rate decision out of the Central Bank of Mexico. So we're still looking at a series of drivers that are out here. But I think the takeaway at this point on the US dollar is that failed breakdown potential that had initially showed post FOMC. Now, to my ears, the takeaway from FOMC yesterday was the fact that the Fed just reiterated again that they're not looking to hike rates unless there's a really significant rise in inflation. Now, with that being said, the dot plot matrix, the manner with which the bank will generally communicate those expectations, had highlighted that the FOMC is looking to stand pat through next year with the potential for one hike in 2021. So we can maybe make the argument that that dot plot matrix came out slightly hawkish just on the fact that the bank is still talking of the prospect of a hike at some point 
without looking at any additional cuts in the near term. Um, but I do not believe that that's the reason for the bullish response here that we have in the USD. I think this is more based on the fact that um, we are seeing some of those shorts covered after a new driver under the equation earlier this morning. Now, with that said, there are items of interest on either side of the scenario, really depending on how a trader wants to approach the dollar at the moment. And I'm going to look at a few of these different setups across the FX landscape. <clears throat> Starting off with most popular currency pair in the world. This one was in the spotlight, <clears throat> given that we had that uh, ECB rate decision earlier today. Now, this was Miss Christine Lagarde's first rate decision atop European Central Bank. It didn't appear to go very smoothly, in my opinion. But with that said, it was just her first rate decision as the head of a central bank. So it's one of those things where this might be a tone setting or a foundational type of event, but I would be surprised if she doesn't learn from this. <clears throat> as in the types of questions that she's going to be posed with, uh, the type of facts that are going to drive markets. Now, in euro dollar, given that USD weakness that showed up yesterday around FOMC, we did see the currency flex up to a fresh monthly high, catching a bit of resistance right here around 11.45, and that comes in via the 50% retracement of this recent major move, taking the June swing high, drawing that down to the October swing low. Now, there is a bit of confluence here uh, as... Um, just underneath, about 10 pips lower, we have a 786 retracement of the shorter term major move. And we also have a trend line projection that can be found by connecting that June, or excuse me, the August swing high to the October swing high. Now that also caught the late October, early November resistance, also came into play yesterday and again this morning. Now, so far today, we're getting an aggressive pullback on this candle. But again, this to me feels like it was a lot more driven um, by dynamics around the U.S.-China trade dispute, let's call it that, as opposed to anything that directly came out of the ECB. Uh, case in point, 8.30 is when that ECB press conference began. Notice that the initial response, quick flicker of strength here in the euro dollar. It wasn't until... An hour later, here, let's just get a bit more specific with that. We go down to a 30-minute chart. There you go. You can see where 9.30 comes into play, the U.S. equity market open, right around the time that President, tweet, uh, President Trump tweet came into the equation, and that's what gave us a pretty strong reversal here in euro dollar. Now, that same price that we had looked at on Tuesday has not come back into play as support. That's, that plot's ended around 11.04. That's a 6.18 of that shorter term retracement we had looked at just a moment ago. This is also a zone of prior resistance. So this could be a compelling area to investigate for swing lows in the effort of trading continuation strategies higher, looking for retests around 11.35 or 11.45. Now the key is going to be watching to make sure that buyers do in fact come in to show support off of that low. Like we're testing the zone right now. So it'd still be too early to say game over, that support worked, it's going to hold. Uh, the alternative thesis is if we don't get a swing low cauterizing right within this zone, the most recent swing low that would have to be used for stop placement is about 35 pips away from current prices, which could be a bit more difficult to justify on a retest of 11.35. 11.45 could get better than a slightly one-to-one -one risk reward ratio if using that point specifically as a stop. But it does seem like it's a little bit too close uh, profit targets a little bit too close for comfort uh, and justifying risk reward scenarios on long positions in uh, euro dollar right now. Uh, the alternative side of this, looking at the short side, stops would likely want to be lodged above 11.55, 11.54, the swing high that came into play earlier this morning, right around that ECB press conference uh, or around the time that press conference began. There is the fear that the train's already left the station, price is already 50 pips off of that swing high. But if comfortable with the drive down to this prior support zone around that 1050 level that had come into play just a couple of weeks ago, then a 1 1 could be justified down to that spot, after which additional targets could be cast down towards that longer term zone around the 110 area. It's already held three different support inflections over the past couple of months. So for right now, it's at short term support, it's putting in that test. Buyers hold that support. If we see a respect of that support, it could be a workable theme for top side swings. Until then, uh, the short side swing scenario is probably going to be the most 
popular or the most followed uh, approach on Euro dollar right now, especially given that uh, press conference from Miss Lagarde earlier this morning. All right, cable. So there's some drivers going on in the background uh, that I am not allowed to speak on at the moment. There's an election law in the UK that says that, uh, or that, 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 that regulates how these matters are spoken about. So I'm not going to talk about drivers at all here. Uh, now, with that said, there are some economic items of interest in the not too distant future. Like tomorrow morning, we get those inflation expectations for the next 12 months. Next Thursday brings in a Bank of England rate decision. And then uh, Wednesday, we get UK CPI. So there are some economic drivers to note over the next week. Uh, in cable, the pair has, uh, after that initial rally on the back of the FOMC yesterday, pushing up to like 32 and a quarter, prices have begun to fold right back. Now, earlier we did see a hold or a test of support at that 31.17 level that had come into play a few different times over the past couple of weeks but that is now being shredded directly through. Now on Tuesday, I talked about the prospect of a 130 retest. That would be the next area to follow, in my opinion. Uh, there could be some potential around 3050, although that might be a bit aggressive given how quickly prices have come off so far today. So in one of these types of scenarios where we're getting a counter trend move of fairly decent size, this is one of those areas where I might just be able to cast back to a longer term chart, look to see if support plays in around a prior area of resistance. And if I see that support hold, then great. That door could quickly reopen for topside swing potential, similar to what we were looking at on Euro dollar just a moment ago. If it doesn't, if it keeps cutting, that's fine. There's deeper support levels to look at or work with around the 129 handle. So the way something like this could be worked with is if it does cut through 130, something is has shifted in the backdrop, shall we say. At that point, a 129 retest then opens the door for a pullback or a swing back towards this 130 area for lower high resistance. And that's the point where I could start looking at taking this previously bullish theme right back down if it is, in fact, going to put in a deeper reversal. All right, uh, dollar yen, this thing has put in some vertical movement today. Um, so I've been following this one for a little while, trying to pick on this little zone of support around 108.47 that until this morning hadn't really shown much promise. I think the promise that, that, that was derived here was largely deductive in nature. The fact that even as the US dollar was peeling away, selling off against many other major currencies, here in dollar yen, it was just sputtering back and forth with an assist that supports on around 108.47. Uh, but this morning's tweet from President Trump offering a bit of optimism on US China trade uh, items Help to flex this thing right back up above that 109 handle, and here we are, kind of going in force gump mode. Uh, hourly chart, you can see where the bar has been raised. We're getting some pretty vicious two-sided price action. Uh, this type of scenario, uh, the potential for a pullback remains fairly attractive, and there's a couple of different areas that could be used, uh, a couple of areas of prior resistance that could be used in the search for that new support. Uh, first and foremost, the 109 handle. I given a quick dose of resistance back here in December, uh, December 5th to be exact. There's a couple of additional resistance swings that could be utilized, such as here, 108.92. That'd be like just a little seven and a half pip zone, or down in here, not that one, that one, 108.85. Now in this case, could be working with about a 14.2 pip zone of potential support as taken for prior resistance. And the, effort, and the effort of looking for a pullback. Uh, targets on long positions, if that scenario does come to fruition, could be redirected right back to that 109.67 to 110 zone. Uh, and I know I've talked about this Fibonacci retracement quite a bit, but I, th I think it's still notable. Uh, the retracement could be found by taking the November 2017 swing high, drawing that down to the March 2018 swing low, each of those retracement levels have put in some really, really interesting inflection so far this year. Uh, most recently, the 38.2 at that 108.47 spot coming into play after a failed test above 109.67 or the 50 fib of that same major move. And I mean, you could draw back historically, look at a number of these inflections coming in off of each of these intervals, uh, like the 7.64, 7.86 expanse. That's what helping to mark or has helped to mark the 2019 swing high.
pretty interesting stuff. All right, dollar CAD. This is also of interest. So last week had the Canadian drivers at the forefront. That was the big story then. Uh, Bank of Canada last Wednesday, uh, Governor Polos didn't really talk up the prospect of a rate cut as many had begun to anticipate, and that brought in some very quick and aggressive CAD strength as dollar CAD fell out of the bottom of that support zone running 32.50 to 32.70. Now that theme lasted for all of the, about 46 hours, because at 8.30 Friday morning, Canadian jobs report came out at the same time that an NFP report came out. And this one was counter trend in both directions on dollar CAD. While we had previously seen dollar CAD weakness, that NFP report brought in a quick dose of uh, US dollar strength. And the Canadian jobs report was pretty bad, brought in a quick dose, Canadian dollar weakness. So this thing flew right back to where it was before the BOC rate decision, finding a bit of resistance off of that same zone of prior support, off of the trend line projection that had held the swing low from late November, swing lows from late November. And when we looked at this on Tuesday, price action had built into a box. Basically just running back and forth without bulls or bears taking control. Well, the bears began to take control yesterday, uh, even ahead of the FOMC. And FOMC put an exclamation point on this as prices pushed right back down towards that 3150 area, not quite making it. Similar to what we've seen in dollar CAD and a number of looks or a number of fronts, sellers pulled away before retesting that prior swing low. So if we go to this on like a daily chart, we look at it from this perspective, we can see where really price action has been in a, a zone of compression for the second half of this year, continuing with lower highs and higher lows. Um, what we're seeing on a very short-term basis is somewhat similar to what we saw on a longer-term basis earlier this summer. In July, sellers remained firmly in control of the pair, pushing all the way down towards that 130 handle. Didn't quite get it. They pulled off the throttle about 15, 10 to 15 pips shy, leading to another arm of that range. Uh, similarly, in October, sellers very much in control, pushing right back down towards that 130 handle. But similarly, Pulled away before retesting the swing low, and then another arm of that range plays right back in. On a short-term basis, that really feels as though it's the same type of thing that's happening right now. Sellers took control around FOMC or ahead of FOMC and around FOMC yesterday, but did not even want to mess with retesting that prior swing low. So notice, over the past month and a half, we've seen a progression of higher lows beginning to build here in dollar CAD. Now that's a longer-term type of type of deal. Not, it's not imminently workable at this point. Uh, I think the one item of interest showing in dollar CAD at the moment is the potential for a resistance check around prior support that comes in confluent with the 38.2% retracement of this recent major move, taking the October swing low, drawing that up to the November swing high. That was also that sh little short-term zone of support that had built in around that box formation that we looked at on Tuesday. If prices do pull back, find sellers there, the door could quickly reopen for stops above the swing high, looking for a retest around that prior swing low, around 3160. I think in this case, I wouldn't even look for a retest of the swing low. I'd want to cast that initial target around 3175. Tighten it up a bit. So that case, if we did get another higher low, I still have a chance of seeing the target or, or, or watching a target come into play. Something along those lines. <laughs> All right, also on the long side of the US dollar, dollar Swiss. So this one, it really looked as though that range was finally going to break. Uh, let's do the daily, there we go. It really looked as though that range was finally going to break. In the wake of that FOMC rate decision, prices trickled down, tested below 98.23, the Fibonacci level that we've been watching on these uh, webinars for a while now, and setting a technical three month low. There wasn't a ton of interest down there though. Like I'm on a four hour chart now, so we're looking at a legitimate amount of data, but look at all of those candlestick wicks as buyers were coming, rushing into the equation. Whenever you see me talk about in an article or in a headline, something is grasping for support, that's a really good illustration of that grasping in the process of taking place. But under the hourly, you can see where there's a real nasty little scenario. From like two o'clock yesterday, just after FOMC, 
about nine o'clock this morning, right around the time that Trump tweet came out. Um, now, with that said, we did not get a daily close below range support, so I'm still looking at range continuation prospects in the pair. You see here on a short-term basis, quick higher high pullback with a bit of higher low support off of that 98.50 level. So now the look is on bulls to see if they can defend this higher low and looking for a push back up towards that 99.02 Fibonacci level that was just in play a couple of weeks ago, helping to set that recent swing high. <laughs> All right, Aussie dollar. So I don't know what in the world is going on here. I think this is one of those scenarios where I just want to take a step back, let it do its thing, and, and reevaluate the scenario later. But when I looked at this on Tuesday, as I had shared, it did feel as though it was a bit oversold, something to the point where I would want that set up to come right back to resistance, showing a re-entrance of sellers before I was going to look to pull the trigger in anticipation of fresh lows. That has not happened. Not only has that not happened, even this morning's US dollar strength was unable to impede that progress. We've just continued to rip. All that all of this this morning's USD strength has done is given us a long legged doji up here near this prior point of resistance. Now, in general, that's the type of thing that I'll look at for fade setups or fade scenarios. But with how aggressively bulls have hit the throttle here, I, I don't feel as if I have the wherewithal to be able to try to time or predict a reversal. So I'm not going to. I'm simply going to take a step back and, again, just let it do its thing. Longer term, there are some reference levels of interest for resistance, as in we've been in this hard bearish pattern for most of 2019. Uh, I think the only thing that has held this up was a test below a psychological level that is at fresh decade lows, 67 handle. And sellers just did not have enough motivation to push the throttle upon another retest there, just given the fact that we've now had four different tests sub 67 each of which has faltered. But now that we're breaking above the trend line, again, my job is fairly simple. It's doing something I was not expecting it to do. So this is not the time to put my hand in the cookie jar and hope that I might be right. Instead, I could just take a step back. I could look at this prior zone of resistance that had come into play early November, right around the 69.25 to 69.33 handle. A little bit higher around the 70 big fig is another item of interest. Now, if bulls could bust through both of those, then maybe something has shifted in the backdrop. And that's the point where I could begin to start evaluating the other side of the scenario, looking for strength to come back and maybe even an eventual retest of this longer term zone that runs between around 71.85 to 72.06. So, still a couple of last items of hope here for Aussie bears. There's this little resistance zone that helped to mark the swing highs in uh, early November. The 70 big fig could be a notable area to look for resistance to play in. But if buyers are able to trounce right back above 70, and again, likely there's been a shift of some kind. That's the time to start evaluating a flip in the stance. All right, Kiwi dollar. It's just continued to run. Uh, the dollar weakness that came into play yesterday helped to bring back in another fresh four month high. Um, so the difference between this one and Aussie is the fact that this bullish move had really started ahead of yesterday. Prices broke above a really big area of resistance just a couple of weeks ago. We looked at it again last week. Uh, prices continued to run above the 65 area, even a quick pullback uh, into yesterday was strongly bid which is what helped to bring back into play those fresh, uh, fresh four month highs. Um, now the swing low printed right around that Fibonacci level that we had looked at on Tuesday, right around 65.18. It looks as though there's a bit of higher low support that's attempting to hold around prior resistance, but in full disclosure, this move really does look like it might be nearing that overbought state, like daily chart, RSI. It's been overbought for a little while now. Now, a market could get even more and more overbought. The oscillators are terrible for timing indicators, but it does add a bit of context here. When we get into those overbought levels, those overbought readings, it's around the time where you don't want to push too heavy on the side of chasing. So again, I think this is a scenario where uh, patience is, is of order looking for a bit of a pullback 
to one of these higher low areas of support that's a little bit further away from just that prior point of resistance that came in just a couple of weeks ago or last week, excuse me. In essence, allowing those overbought conditions to come back down, settle or normalize a bit. Uh, case in point as to why oscillators aren't great for timing indicators, early August, this thing went oversold. That was right around the time that Kiwi had closed at 64.38. But notice what happens with the RSI indicator. It just stayed in that oversold or around that oversold zone until early September when there was an extra 150 pips of run on the downside there. So it might continue to run higher. But with prices being overbought on the daily, this is not a great time to try to line up fresh long exposure in Kiwi dollar, in my humble opinion. Let's see if there's a, another resistance level of note, maybe something like around 65.40, maybe something like that could be usable, you know, particularly if there was a good, respectable show of buyer support or bid support coming in around that level. At the very least, that could open the door for stops below that swing low that came to play yesterday, or excuse me, Tuesday. Um, thereby keeping the door open for bullish continuation prospects in Kiwi dollar. Okay, one last market that I wanted to look at, and then we'll start taking some questions, and that is a market that's been really busy so far today in gold. So I had sent a tweet out a little earlier this morning because as Christine Lagarde was speaking, gold prices went ballistic. Notice 0800 right here as that press conference began, even into the 0900 hour. Let's do this off a 15-minute chart. Even into the 0900 hour, notice we get extension of that move, but it tempered. And then it was right here at 9.30 when it came right back to earth. Again, right around the time that President Trump sent that tweet offering uh, some optimism, some hope around U.S. China trade deal. Gold prices splashed right back to where they were uh, yesterday morning. And it's one of those uh, thanks for the ride, it's been fun playing kind of scenarios. That's just the peril of trading on short-term charts. The shorter term you get, the more liable or, or vulnerable you are to noise or near-term stimuli, similar to what we've seen this morning. Uh, now, with that being said, the longer-term backdrop here is still intact on the long side of the equation. As in, the summer breakout produced a notable move. The 38.2% retracement of that move is what's currently helping to mark the three-month low. That comes in right around 1446. There's also been an assist on the support side from a bullish trend line. That's connected from the August swing low to the November swing low. Really good iteration of grind there in late November, early December. Now, as I had shared on Tuesday, um, and then I did a podcast yesterday where I talked about this quite a bit, but I'm of the mind, especially if we do see a continued lack of commitment to further rate cuts out of the Fed, this is a scenario that could still be classified as a bull trap. It looks almost too clean for comfort on the long side. I was a little bit surprised when prices were jumping up to a fresh high earlier this morning uh, in, in the fact that the move was coming in so early. Now, with that being said, if we look at the way that the breakout had priced in from June into September, this was one of those scenarios where buyers weren't going to wait around. Notice that these pullbacks weren't even really getting to the level where they had test prior areas of resistance. Right, like we get the swing high at like 1358. Just a couple of days later, prices are all the way at 1438. But when prices pulled back off of that level, we didn't get back to that prior swing high, did we? Buyers stepped in ahead of time. We get the series of higher lows before another bullish breakout shows up. So while longer term, I think the long side of this one remains attractive because nobody's really looking for a rate hike out of the Fed anytime soon. You know, even 2021 sounds like it might be a little bit early. Until the Fed's in a spot where they have to commit to further dovish policy, further rate cuts, there might not be too much motivation for bulls to rush in to protect the bid here. Um, so for that bull trap scenario, item one I'm looking for is a retest of 1460, the little zone that came into play as support earlier this week. Below that, it's a real chunky zone of support that runs between around 1450 up to around 1453. Then below that, 1446. Now, I'm imagining there's probably a lot of stops on longer-term bullish positions that are set just below that. So if we break that swing low, I do expect to get a bit of hastening 
in that move. And that's where something like 1421 to 1433 could come back into play. Support zone looked at previously, that runs right in here, comprised of a Fibonacci level going up to the August 2013 swing high. Right there. Still an attractive thesis on the short side of the dollar, but I do think this is one that's more long-term in nature. Uh, and now, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. Let me know what's on your mind. Uh, for Pete, thank you, James. Wow, dollar yen with risk. Yeah, that was a heck of a move. But I also think, you know, especially, um, you know, for those that are maybe still getting a little more comfortable with price action, I think this is a good illustration of how deduction could sometimes be uh, uh, a pretty strong workable type of theme. As in, you know, even when we were getting dollar weakness yesterday, Dollar yen just went right back down to support, even retained a bit of bullish posture in the fact that buyers were continuing to respect some of those prior swing lows. Like that was the post FOMC swing low. But still above the swing low from last week. There we go, last week and then earlier this week. And buyers just continuing to push. Uh, Mr. Vinnie Palma, what a charade withholding offers for a convenient time to pump stocks is on the edge of illegal, in my humble opinion. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's not the market that I learned. That is for sure. Um, you know, it's a lot's changed in the social media age. You know, and um, and maybe it's not all because of social media, but uh, I'm right there with you. The the timing of these releases are are, are pretty strange. Not strange. It's, it's pretty odd that it's gone on without more people questioning it. But uh, but yeah. Uh, for Pete, is it me or is your screen blurry? Uh, it doesn't look blurry to me, um, but I am using a higher resolution monitor than I usually use. I'm using a 2560 by 1440 right now, whereas usually it's a 1920 by 1080. Um, and I also have the, the banner down below, but, uh, it looks, looks fine from my end. Uh, if anybody else is seeing the same, let me know and, and I'll see what I could do to get that adjusted for us. Uh, from Pete, and this just could be a very valid point for sure. Um, Euro may be getting drawn down sympathetically by, uh, Sterling's drop, kind of a continental type of move. Yeah, it, it, it's certainly possible, you know, um, the timing of it this morning with that Trump tweet is why I had assumed that the driver was what it was. Because, I mean, this 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 really started right around 930, you know. Um, but, yeah, there's there's certainly something to be said about I mean, maybe a bit of a correlated move there. Uh, unfortunately, I can't get too deep on the topic of uh, UK elections today, uh, given that statute that's on the books there. And, and I don't want to. I don't want to anger any any British politicians, that's for sure. Uh, Mr. Vinnie Palma, James uh, Lagarde did not seem satisfied the bank is buying enough assets. So fundamentally, I'm a little worried Euro dollar may not hold medium term. Uh, thoughts of the TA slam possibly? Thanks, Vinny. Well, you know, from a technical perspective, we're still kind of in the same spot we we were on Tuesday, which is, it, uh, well, I say kind of in the same spot. Um, you know, when I looked at this on Tuesday, we basically had like a range within a range. And the item this morning that was, that was really exciting is the prices did bust up or burst up to a fresh monthly high, thereby giving ideas or, or, or potential to breaking out of the symmetrical wedge formation that's been brewing for the better part of the last, for the second half of the year. Um, but it came right back down around that Trump tweet. So I don't, I don't know that there's necessarily a concerted dovish push that's been seen off of Lagarde. I think that maybe the, the counterbalance to that is what she's continued to say about or, or allude to in the, the realm of uh, fiscal spending, fiscal stimulus. It really seems to me like, and I've probably said this numerous times before, like Lagarde is going to lean on her political background to try to get some of these, these sovereign governments in Europe to stimulate their economies through fiscal means as opposed to just relying on the ECB constantly. Um, but with that said, you know, and, and specific to her remarks this morning, um, 
I think she'd even denoted it as something like uh, governments that do have an ability to expand fiscally should, something like that. Well, of course, not all governments in Europe have the ability to expand fiscally. I mean, we just came through a, a, you know, a, a debt standoff last year between Italy and Brussels. You know, so so you know, per Miss Lagarde's recommendation, Italy literally can't do anything else. They they've had to have their spending reined in. Uh, same with Greece. They can't really increase their their spending. They've 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 had to rein it in. So, you know, maybe she's got a dual pronged approach where she's going to lean on states in Northern Europe that are more economically healthy or, or maybe even viable in our current scenario, um, while also supporting those in Southern Europe through continued bond purchases, asset purchases, etc. Um, as far as buying more, I don't. <laughs> they're eventually going to run out of stuff to buy. I think, um, you know, unless they start buying. You know, unless they unless they start with a helicopter money type of strategy like the Bank of Japan and uh, buying U.S. ETFs, which uh, as as an American investor sounds good to me, <laughs> but I don't know that that's anything that's going to happen in the in, in the uh, near future. <laughs> Uh, Pete saying uh, the font is small and blurry today. Okay, yeah, my apologies. I, that is probably because of the computer's resolution, but I can fix that really quickly, really, really quickly. It's so one of these options in here to increase this font size, scale size. That's what it is. There we go. Let's get it a little bit bigger. Go 28. I'm not driving. Let's go 28. Sorry, that was a home alone one. Home Alone 2, actually. Um, from Pete, wondering if a lot of the Greenback December Bears closed off after the gift drop from this morning. Also, as POTUS tweeted out, and this move off the ECB bottom could be a great fade again. <sighs> you got me. I, maybe, you know, there's you, the, the more stuff that's going on in the backdrop, the more difficult it is to ascertain which driver pushed what. Um, but there certainly could be a case of that. You know, I think on the front of the U.S. dollar, it's it's one of those scenarios where um, I th I'm not sure if Nick Colley came up with this or if he read it somewhere, but uh, the cleanest shirt and the dirty laundry, right? Like the U.S. hasn't hiked rates at all this year, cut rates thrice, but the U.S. dollar has still continued to march higher. It, which is in direct contrast to 2017. 2017 was pretty bizarre because the Fed hiked, I believe it was, yeah, it was three times in 2017, four in 2018. The Fed hiked three times. Nobody else was really hiking at the time. I mean, the ECB was still pedal to the floor, Bank of Japan the same, China heavy stimulus coming through uh, in 2017. Even though that was taking place, the US dollar just continued to drop all the way into February of 2018. It wasn't until we started to see that issue around uh, Italy uh, and it, the, the Italian budget come in. The dollar strength came back into the fray as your weakness took over. But for most intents and purposes, we're still kind of playing between the cracks. You know, it, it hasn't really been a strong trending type of year. I think 2020 could be a lot different. I think we might be looking at some legitimate trend potential going into next year, but this is one of those scenarios where like that door was open for bears to take control and it, it was open for a little while, right? Like go down to an hourly chart, prices were holding down there for a bit. We even saw some resistance inflections earlier this morning held through ECB's uh, statement, initial portion of the press conference, but it was right around that Trump tweet that this thing just took off and here we are right back at 97.50 after coming perilously close to the 97 handle earlier today. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, almost forgot about the U.S. sales numbers tomorrow with all the other bigger shenanigans. Uh, whew, what a week. Yeah, right. Yeah. And next week, next week, it's pretty legit too, um, you know, especially for the yen. Bank of Japan, uh, this is Tuesday night. Wednesday night, uh, well, Tuesday night in the U.S., uh, Wednesday morning in Japan. Um, a couple of very relevant inflation prints, QBGDP, Aussie employment numbers, uh, Bank of England next Thursday, Banksico a little later, 
It's, it's legit weak. Yeah, U.S. equities are unstoppable. I think that's kind of the deductive takeaway from uh, a number of these drivers so far. It's that, you know, the Fed wants to see higher asset prices. The Fed doesn't want to see this thing folding, similar to what happened in Q4 last year. Uh, Trump wants to see it heading higher. Maybe they have different approaches and maybe they even oppose each other at, at times or it appears as such. But at the end of the day, they both want the same type of thing. And so if we get monetary policy and fiscal policy pushing in a similar direction, that's usually where these, these fireworks are going to really continue to go off. Uh, now, with that being said, interest protocol is of a challenge. I mean, we're up here at fresh all-time highs. These moves are getting pretty jagged, pretty sharp. And the driver today, I mean, it's, it's a tough one to hold on to, right? Because this isn't the first time we've seen President Trump talk up optimistic remarks around a U.S.-China trade deal only for him to reverse shortly thereafter. So tough area. I mean, if it's momentum-based strategy and the trader's really good at holding their stops, could be something workable there. Uh, but I wouldn't want to stand on the tracks when the train's coming through on this one, i.e. looking to basically fade it, call reversals, um, you know, looking for, a, 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 looking for something new to happen after this pattern has been building in fairly well over the past week and a half. <laughs> Uh, from uh, also repeat gold had a nice run this morning too. Yeah, I mean it was beautiful. I think the big takeaway on gold is gold loves Lagarde, and it hates positive items on the U.S. China trade war. Um, it, it still does feel as though it could be a little bit trappy though, which is which is my current trepidation on the matter. Um, you know, but just the way that this sinks in. You know, just looking at off a five-minute chart, it was just after the U.S. equity opened that the gold prices just got crushed lower after a really strong magnified run higher on the back of Ms. Lagarde's commentary earlier today. Uh, for Mr. Mark Mancarius, hi, James. How can I listen to your podcast? Thanks. Uh, that's a really good question, Mark, and thank you for asking that. Um, we will have it posted very soon. I think it's going to come out next week. But as soon as I have it, I will retweet it, and I'll, I'll even I'll, I'll do my best to bring it up on the uh, the next webinar that we have on Tuesday. But I don't believe that it's been released yet. Um, now I've done two in the last week. I did one with Jeremy Naylor and the folks on the IG TV desk. Uh, that one should be a little closer to coming out. And then I did one yesterday with our own Martin Essex and Peter Hanks, and uh, that was probably one of the more fun discussions I've ever had on this type of stuff. Because, um, you know, Peter's a really sharp guy. We were able to get really in-depth on a lot of, of pretty key topics. Um, I even kind of ventured outside of my own pool of comfort and talking a little bit about politics and, and uh, economic prognostications around politics going into next year. But, uh, yeah, as soon as it's released, I'll, I'll certainly do my best to let everybody know um, of its location and how they can access it. Uh, Gary Diebel, so if a trade deal takes place, it looks like the dollar will get bought, judging by today's tweet. And safe haven currency sold, uh, yen and Swiss. Uh, Aussie and Kiwi could get bought as risk on comes into play. Has today's move been a little confusing, do you think? Thoughts would be great. Yeah, it's been pretty vexing, in my opinion, because everything you've said here fits today. But I don't know that it necessarily fits prior iterations of a similar drive. You know, because... Trump's done this before where, you know, markets are selling off or, or maybe, and, and I'm not even referring to the S&P in this case, the U.S. dollar, where there's a, a motive move that's still getting priced in. And then all of a sudden a tweet shows up on Twitter where, you know, he talks up uh, uh, progress between the U.S. and China. And the general like one, two off of that is that stocks go higher. Right? There's usually a nice little bump in equities. Um, in the dollar, it's a little bit more difficult for me to to align that to to a, a specific direction, strength or weakness. The uh, X factor that I see for this morning on USD specifically is that we were just setting at a fresh low. A new factor of change caused some short cover, and now we've seen all of those FOMC bets getting priced out, or those post FOMC bets getting priced out. Um, my takeaway on this one is that. The Fed yesterday 
it really seemed as though they tried to align their stance with economic performance. You know, kind of the whole like, oh, we're data dependent thing that nobody really buys anymore, right? Um, you know, Powell, it seemed as though he tried to keep some dry powder on one side while, you know, not being the sky is falling on the other. And that's where that 2021 rate hike comes in. Just a bit of optimism, but hey, it's nothing to worry about for the next 12 months. Go and buy some risky assets. Everything's going to be okay. We're not going to we're not going to drop the hammer on you with with tighter policy. So I, I see this as more of a, a causation relationship than correlation, where the thought that the Fed is going to remain pat, maybe even opening the door to a cut if the situation required it, was aligned with a continued lack of progress or a lack of a deal, the expectation that the U.S.-China trade dispute was going to go on through the November 2020 election, which I still expect. But as we had a quick flicker of contradiction to that earlier this morning on the basis of that tweet, that hypothesis was wiped out and, and quickly and very soon wiped out. So I don't know that... I can necessarily equate this morning's USD strength on the back of that that Trump tweet with something that I can expect moving forward because this morning's situation was pretty unique in the fact that we had a, a fresh four month low showing in USD after an FOMC rate decision. I, I think it was more of just the fact that those two premises are somewhat aligned where uh, lack of progress on US China at least until the November 2020 presidential election also equates with the potential for a softer Fed. All right, uh, from Quran, Euro pound, please, for sure. Let's see if I can generate anything here. I have to go with my longer term charts. This is my do you feel lucky punk zone. And I'm not calling anybody a punk. Just taking that from the Dirty Harry movie. Um, so 2019, there's been a pension for support to develop down here around that 85 handle. And this is like a 35, 40-ish pip zone. Right here on 84.70 up to around 85.08, 85.06. But notice where there was a really good setting of support back here in March. It slowed down the sell-off in November, early December. But as that sterling strength was just throttling, we cut right through it. Now we're pulling back for a bit of resistance. So for those that really do want to go for the jugular on the short side of Euro Pound, this could be a pretty interesting place to start looking for resistance to come into play. Like two-hour chart, it's still early. All we have is a quick wick. There's no indication that that resistance is, in fact, going to hold. Uh, but this is the area to start following for that, I think, as it tests back above a big figure at 85, catching a bit more selling pressure coming into play. On the long side, I think, would be really difficult to work with, given that a lot of this move is already priced in. And I simply don't know if I'd be able to justify that risk outlay off of those lows. Okay, so i got a couple of folks that are saying the tiny font made it difficult to see. Um, but then I get a couple of folks that are saying it looks very clear and it looks great. Keep going. We'll see if there's more feedback as we get through some more of these questions. Uh, from Quran, dollar yen B, how do you prep for these moves? Do you just place a limit order at your chosen levels, or do you watch to see if they set up, uh, if the setup sets up, so to speak, and then place the order live? So I have a pretty systematic way that I approach markets, and and I've talked about this before because I think that uh, paralysis by analysis is something that can happen pretty frequently in this game. So I think the easiest way is just to force decisions by limiting your operable space. What I look at is I look at the four hour candle at the close of each four hour candle. For me in New York, that's five, nine and one, five, nine and one, five, nine and one. At the close of that four hour candle, I take like 10 minutes and I just scan through these major pairs. And then I look to see if any of them are set up. 
And I'll always place a stop on everything that I trigger. I'll usually keep the limit side of the equation open. I look at it as a defense first type of strategy. I want to protect my downside. Upside, I want to try to grasp as much of that as I can, which is why I look at scaling out of every single setup that I'm in. Because if it's going to give me 200, I want to get as much of that 200 as I can. I also don't want to hold a whole lot for 200, only to get 188 for it to turn around. And well, now I'm blaming myself for the fact that I didn't take anything out of that. So um, generally, I scale out in incremental fashion. If this setup's going to have more room to run, I want to try to get as much as I can on the later pieces of the lot. But at the end of the day, your job as a trader is to make decisions, right? And it could be really, really difficult when completely unbounded like if you're just following prices all day on a chart all day um, it could be difficult to get over that hump as to how you can confidently trigger and and feel okay about it so I try to simplify it systematize it okay 1 p.m. my little watch goes off I use the Apple watch so I get the little vibration feature and then I'll just take 10 quick minutes and I'll look at the way the thing's set up if it's something like I got a webinar uh, then I'll simply do that 10 minutes before one o'clock but if I'm at a dinner, whatever, with my wife, and uh, you know, my, I get that little vibration on my watch at nine o'clock. Hey, sorry, honey, I'm gonna need to gonna need to do a little bit of work here. Just makes my life a lot easier. Uh, from North Biznet uh, Oil, do you expect a pullback? If yes, how low? When do you think we may get a substantial pullback? This one's really been headline driven of recent, so the timing of that I feel is uh, very very tough to predict. My current thesis on oil is looking for looking for swings off of resistance. We're buttering right back up to that 60 handle, which has been a, a pretty workable area of resistance very recently. Uh, I got a Fibonacci, uh, I have a Fibonacci level of 59.64. This is the 50 fib or the 50% halfway marker of that Q4 sell-off. Was last in the play last week. And so about the best that I have is just looking for a hold of resistance, relatively tight stop above, and then looking for prices to push back off of that. Bit of mean reversion back in the equation. Uh, from Vinny, yeah, James, on the gold, one could think trade deal notwithstanding that it might remain bid because of Fed upside inflation tolerance and mainly uh, a huge persistent U.S. deficit spending versus tiny growth. Just saying. Yeah, for sure. I just don't know how motivated that move would be to get priced in, you know, because I think the, to, to my eyes, at least the big allure on gold was the fact that it was it basically, uh, you know, that old saying up the stairs, down the elevator. Well, it's kind of in reverse here on gold, right? We're just taking the elevator on the way up and it's just slowly cascading down the stairs on the way back down. But this to me, it feels like a, it feels like a fear bid. You know, if you look at the near parabolic like move that was priced in, um, after that falling wedge earlier this year. It really does feel as though it's a fear bid, which is why I'm of the, the mind that I am on uh, drivers as far as gold is concerned. Just because how aggressively it moves when it's on the way up and then how slowly it shuffles or has shuffled when it's on the way back down. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about the UK election. Uh, some of these, these, these local laws that, uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Vinny Palma, man, she loves Greece. Haha, <laughs> what a model. <laughs> uh, thanks for all your work commentary. Nice job, Vinny. Yes, sir. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, from Pete, wow, Cable and Gepi. We have not looked at Gepi today. Let's take a look, see what it's got going on. Okay, here's what's kind of deceiving. Look at the weekly. <laughs> it's just an inverted hammer. We look at the, uh, let's go to like a four hour. Yeah, some decent volatility in there. Uh, not to the same degree as cable, but yeah, there's some some decent volatility in there for sure. Good old cable. Yeah, I think this one's gonna remain on the move for a little bit, a little while at least. Hey, there we go. Karan's on that short cable. Well done. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, 155. So I got a couple more minutes. I'm going to try to answer a, a few more questions before we cut it. I'm not going to be able to get them all today, but uh, 
I'm gonna get as many as I can here. Uh, from Kenneth Montalvo, hey James, I know this is unrelated, but I wanted your thoughts on what people refer to as uh, mass market psychology. Is this sentiment? Further, I don't understand how a market tethered to central banking systems can operate on retail trader psychology. Those are awesome questions. Um, so I'm going to try to parse through them. Um, mass market psychology. I think there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. Um, I think one could kind of tilt towards sentiment, but there's a few different ways of looking at sentiment, right? Like there's the commodity traders report that parses it up a little bit. There's something like IG client sentiment where we look solely at retail and, and do so in a contrarian fashion. Um, I do think there are other elements to it though than just sentiment because like in here, we could even use daily effects as an example, right? Cause if we go into the sentiment on say, uh, let's see here, let's focus on the S and P, right? S and P, um, 74% bearish, 26% bullish. Now this is retail positioning, generally something that's looked at in a contrarian nature, right? But 74% of retail traders in this sample are bearish or, or, or short. But if we look at price action, it has most definitely not been bearish or short in the spoos of late. It's been long and strong, right? So the psychology that I would glean off of this is that these retail traders have continually been trying to call a top and they've continually failed as institutions or bigger players have just continued to, to back the bid, adding size, um, which, which kind of, brings on your second question or your second point, which is, I don't understand how a market tethered to central banking system can operate on retail trader psychology. Well, I don't know that it's necessarily operating on as much as in anticipation of or in opposition of. Because if we look at all of the possible indicators or ways to get ideas as to what to trade, pretty much everything is lagging in nature. Like the price action that I look at, it's built off of previous prices with the idea that, okay, well, maybe if that price comes in again, maybe we get a similar response. At the very least, I have an area where I could look to risk a dollar to try to make two. So if that sequence or scenario continues, then great. And if it doesn't, then I can try to mitigate the loss. Um, now, I use that over indicators like RSI because RSI, it's also lagging. But it's also lagging through rose-colored glasses because this previous price action is now being pumped through a mathematical equation that's set up to look in a certain way, whether it's as an oscillator or as just a pure read indicator. Sentiment's a little different though. Sentiment's a little different because if we're looking at a pool where 74% of the evaluated samples are short, 24 or 26% are long, well, what do we know has to happen at some point in the future? At some point in the future, those 74% that are short are going to have to buy to cover. The 26% that are long are going to have to sell to close. So all factors equal, this is highlighting the fact that there could be greater bid pressure at some point in the future if this market were to flatten out. Like for us to get back to 50-50, that's going to equate to more buying than selling because these folks have to cover while these folks sell to close. Now, the fact that there is that leading indicator element, I think that's something that's also attractive to institutions and in trying to plot what they're looking for or where they're looking at. So when we see something like this where there is an imbalance, a uh, very heavy short side scenario in retail trader sentiment, I think if an institution looks at that and they're like, well, hey, the S&P has been rocking, retail traders are still trying to catch this top, and if they have to flip at some point, that's more potentially more even more bid pressure so again, I don't think it's necessarily um, operating on retail trader psychology as much as it's in anticipation of or in opposition of. But end of the day, markets can get pretty crazy pretty fast. They're utterly unpredictable. And about the best I could do is just try to read the tea leaves with what we have. Again, most of which is just looking at the past. And as we all know, the past does not predict the future. Sometimes it gives a template for how that future plays out, but not all the time. New stuff happens. It's what makes life exciting. So kind of a good and a bad thing.
Okay, I'm out of time, so I'm going to have to take the last couple questions of the day. Um, yeah, I like this. So, I mean, Gary has a, a, a really simple way of looking at this, which is something I try to keep in mind, even though we'll talk about a lot of these drivers or look at a lot of this noise. Um, dollars that supports, I'll look to buy. Um, so, if that resistance, it was probably a sell when the tweets come out. Yeah, and so, you know, at the end of the day, it, 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 that, that, that's kind of hitting the, the, the meat of the issue right in the face, right? Which is our job is to try to forecast what's going to happen in the future, but all we really have to make those decisions is what's happened in the past. So I think that the water could get pretty muddied, especially if we're like reading headlines, uh, particularly if we have like a strong political bias. I've seen this happen a lot, even to really good traders that are just so caught into this current political scenario that they think that it has to go in one direction or it has to go in 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 in, in one way or, or, or fashion. And no, it doesn't, because if it was a given that that was already going to happen, then you would get the big banks and the big market players um, uh, rushing in as soon as they could on that basis, and then prices would already be higher. It would already be reflected in the market. I believe that the market is a little bit more efficient than what could be gleaned off headlines from USA Today. Just my personal opinion. I look at markets as being a little bit more chaotic and, and, and much more efficient than that. Um, which is why in these webinars, I look at price action. This is all stuff that's actually happened. That may open the door to what could or possibly what might happen tomorrow, but it's definitely not a template. It's a way to look, it's a risk management strategy. It's a way to look for ways to risk a dollar to try to make two, which is you know pretty much the same modus operandi from any other business owner for any other type of industry in the world. Take a finite amount of risk capital and, and turn that into more. And you turn that into more or try to turn that into more by taking smart risks. <laughs> uh, another good point here from Vinny. I think today's USD strength could have easily been a one-off based on positioning. So yes, you're right. Tomorrow's another day. Yeah, I, 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 and I, I have another kind of X factor as to why I led into that. It, it's exactly what happened last Friday. You know, we had talked about this uh, last Thursday ahead of NFP. Um, you know, and and it was a, it was a good report. Don't get me wrong. You know, it was a blowout NFP report. But it was really just one day, you know, and then sellers got right back into the driver's seat. You know, at this point, we just have one day on the back of one tweet. And it's a spurious issue, too, that, uh, that I'm, I'm personally of the belief it's going to take a little while longer to, to settle something out there. I mean, even if we do get a reduction in these tariffs. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, so I see a couple other folks were saying that the uh, the screen was a little bit blurry, but uh, uh, the screen on the sentiment was a little bit blurry. I can increase that too, though. There we go. But uh, yeah, hopefully that, that bigger scale size helps out. Slightly higher resolution. I mean, it's great for me setting up charts at home, but uh, if, if you're looking at it from a 1920 by 1080, it might not be as great. Uh, okay, so for the last question of the day, uh, looking for a quick run through on cable. Um, so yeah, sure, no problem. And uh, again, I can't really talk about drivers because of that UK election law. I uh, don't want anybody to think I'm trying to coerce a, a public election in any way whatsoever. I'm not. Um, but we have seen a breach of short-term support that came in off that 3117 level. And there's some some pretty interesting workable areas here on cable off these Fibonacci retracements. Um, first and foremost, perhaps most importantly, this 38.2 is coming in off of the Brexit move. The June 2016 swing high drawn to the October 2016 swing low, both prices of which have not yet been taken out. That's where the 31.17 level comes into play. The 130 spot, the area that I'm looking for possible support plays, is just the psychological level connected with the swing high that came in October as that level was getting tested. It gives me a 
little little berth, if you will, in that little zone right in there. And I'm using a prior Fibonacci retracement uh, to pull in this 129 level, which is confluent with another Fibonacci level. And then the 23.6 of that October breakout, that's what brings in the 28.20 price. That 28.20 gave a couple of good doses of support. But man, it's just so far away right now. If, if we pull back another 260 pips, I don't know that we're looking at the same scenario. Um, but yeah, for right now, we're still elevated well above that 130 spot. It's like I talked about on Tuesday. We cut through that really aggressively, haven't yet tested back for support. So uh, interesting area to look at if it comes into play anytime soon. Uh, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I have one final webinar in the calendar year of 2019, and that is on Tuesday. And I hope you have the time to visit with me. If you do, I'd love to see you back in the room. But uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.